morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's program. We're very glad to have you here. And uh, so as I don't forget, a, a particular shout out to Ashley Nichol from the Packer Magazine, who was very kind enough to send us some questions in advance uh, to today's interactive dialogue, uh, which we'll be addressing those questions in the, the course of today's program. Um, I wanted to uh, welcome everybody as uh, folks are logging in and to uh, give you, I'm going to highlight again the uh, audio portion if you're sitting next to somebody who's saying, why can't I hear anything? Make sure that they know to dial in. Uh, I uh, wanted to give a brief overview of the program and, uh, and to welcome everybody, uh, in particular noticing a, a couple of names. Marlis, good to see your name on there, and uh, Mike Duckworth, always a pleasure and look forward to your feedback. Um, uh, we have a great program today. It's the second in a series of uh, presentations on the same topic, uh, namely the impact of new uh, legislation and regulations in regards to uh, GMO uh, uh, labeling and the impacts of that on employers and companies in the food and agribusiness industry. Uh, my name is Mike Droke. I'm a partner in the Food, Ag, and Cooperative uh, Practice Group. Uh, practicing in Seattle, Washington. Uh, here, delighted uh, to be with Chip uh, Magid from the other Washington office. Uh, Chip, welcome. Thank you, Mike. Great to be here. Dorsey and Whitney is a global law firm. We have 19 practice offices uh, around the world. Those include at least two offices with the name Washington in them. Uh, two offices also in California, New York, uh, Minneapolis, London, Shanghai, Hong Kong, uh, truly uh, around the, the globe. Um, we, a few years ago, started looking at our practices, not just from the perspective of the work that we do, uh, but also from the perspective of the industries that our clients are in and therefore the industries that we serve as well. Uh, and the uh, in the course of that, we really um, understood, which is something, something we've known before, but understood in a deeper way, uh, namely that we have a very strong practice in the area of food, agribusiness, and cooperatives. Uh, Dorsey has around 250 lawyers who are members of uh, the food and agribusiness uh, pra industry practice group, myself and Chip included, and uh, we address issues uh, that really kind of run the gamut. So this program has been uh, really fun uh, this uh, interactive dialogue series in the food and agribusiness industry because we've taken on uh, interesting topics uh, that apply to various uh, people who are also in that industry. So we looked at uh, regulations for the uh, Clean Water Act, for example. Uh, we've uh, addressed uh, issues of GMO labeling. As I mentioned, we're going to talk now about GMO litigation and uh, labeling uh, trade litigation. And uh, we've taken on other topics as well for uh, those who uh, uh, have other topics in the industry that you think would be interesting to hear about, uh, please let one of us know, uh, and we would be delighted to uh, address additional programs as well. So this, this uh, particular format arose uh, really from the kind of confluence of two things. Uh, uh, first was a, a comment that I had with Jennifer Keegan from Vegetable, Vegetable Grower Supply in California, somebody I've known for a very long time uh, and I've worked with and, and really respect. Uh, and she attended a web format and said, wow, Mike, that was the first time I, I heard you speak. And I thought, boy, you know, as lawyers, we often will talk uh, in person to clients and friends, uh, but the web uh, is a somewhat new format. It is, is often a better way to reach uh, people in their offices on their schedule and the like. The second uh, coincidence was that I was uh, listening to some uh, web-based and, uh, and radio programs uh, talking about uh, various issues. And, and it really came to me that um, it, sometimes the you know, typical format is to take a very comprehensive list of 75 uh, you know, uh, very text-based slides and uh, cram them through the internet, uh, and that that isn't always appealing, especially when you know we recognize folks are multitasking uh, as they're uh, listening to the program and the like. So uh, this program is different; it's designed to be different. Uh, we have uh, much less by way of slides, but more by way of discussion. And I very strongly encourage participants to uh, ask questions throughout the program. You'll see at the bottom uh, left-hand pane of your screen 
there's a chat section. And in that chat section, you can send questions to Chip and me. Uh, I will then weave those questions into the program and uh, we'll identify you by name if you don't say something. But if you want to be remain anonymous, that's fine too. Uh, you can um, just put something to that effect in your question and I'll make sure and keep your name uh, private. So uh, with that, uh, let's get going. Uh, I've given a little bit of introduction to myself, but Chip, can you explain a little bit about uh, your uh, own background as well? Sure. Um, as you can see on the slide, I'm a, a partner in uh, Dorsey's litigation practice. Uh, I do a great deal of commercial litigation, product liability litigation, uh, and work in the uh, food and agriculture uh, industries. I've been uh, at Dorsey for 29 years, which explains the gray hair on the slide. Um, and uh, I'm originally an Iowan, which means I have a deep connection with the food industry. And uh, Chip, although I know you uh, reside, you know, in the Washington D.C. office, is that where you limit your practice, or do you have uh, matters around the country? No, it's a it's a national practice, and uh, uh, which is great to to see uh, regional differences and and some of the overlaps between uh, different state laws and, and federal law. But it's a uh, it's a national practice, which uh, uh, gives me the opportunity to uh, keep my finger on on trends as they're happening around the nation. And just to uh, give an idea for folks of the perspective that you're bringing, can, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the product liability practice at Dorsey? Sure. Uh, you know, we define our products uh, liability practice a little differently than most. We, this can involve, uh, or, or within the group, uh, our lawyers who specialize in uh, not only claims that involve personal injury, but also uh, claims of mislabeling or uh, uh, incorrect warranties or business-to-business -business disputes. Um, uh, we also uh, have tried to be different than other practices from other firms around the country in that our real focus is to uh, help educate our clients, uh, not just uh, directly one-on-one, -on -one, but with uh, online tools and, and other things that are free. Uh, and, and they're not limited to our clients, by the way, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, but try to make uh, our, our clients and our communities uh, much more aware of developments in regulation, in law, uh, and uh, in fact, regulation, not just in the U.S., but around the world, uh, so that they are better prepared to avoid litigation. Fantastic. Uh, a, a lawyer who wants to have less work from clients because they don't have the same problems the second time. Yeah, I, exactly. I mean, it's a little counterintuitive, uh, and uh, we'll see if I end up eating ramen noodles because of it. But uh, uh, you know, our, our genuine idea is, is that rather than waiting for disaster to strike and kind of swooping in like Red Adair, is to uh, uh, help our clients get ahead of the issues, really understand what's happening around the globe, uh, be a better service partner to our clients and, and not just uh, lawyers when, when uh, everything starts falling apart. Fantastic. Uh, so thank you again. And, you know, this program is uh, part of uh, our, our effort to take experts like you, Chip, and uh, ask a bunch of questions about what's happening out in the legal uh, world, not just, um, you know, the appellate cases, because often those happen years after uh, the issues start to happen on the ground, but also kind of what's happening out there in the real world and on the ground with clients and in industries to, uh, so that people can uh, better prepare and, and avoid litigation. And, you know, this topic is very interesting. Our next slide is kind of why I picked this topic. And I, if, Chip, if it's okay with you, I'd, I'd like to start by answering that question, okay? Go ahead. So uh, this is the second in a series, uh, and what we really realized was that the topic was kind of too broad to address in only one program, uh, that instead we wanted to kind of break it into two. First, the first program happened a couple of weeks ago. It's available on uh, Dorsey.com website. You can uh, listen to it. It was an interview with myself and Robert Hensley on the uh, topic of the recent GMO legislation that happened and the effects of that from a business and practical perspective. And we'll be talking in a little bit more detail in today's program as well on some of these topics. But a brief summary I think would be helpful. Um, as Robert described in more detail, what, what happened was that you started really with a, a consumer demand in a way. Uh, consumers wanted to have products that they understood were more natural, 
uh, that meant that clients and, and uh, producers were packaging uh, their, uh, their products and using terms like uh, all natural, you know, healthy, those kinds of things. And so then often what happens in the regulation world is the questions are asked, okay, so what does that actually mean? And uh, the um, problem occurred for uh, our clients uh, in that the state of Vermont issued a um, set of laws uh, that very specifically regulated what could be uh, used in packaging, what had to be disclosed as far as packaging was concerned. And for more information about what that law involved, you will uh, should uh, listen to the last program. Uh, but what happened from there is that uh, the federal government got involved and issued a new statute that preempts that Vermont law and that uh, as a um, you know, practical matter gives us more of a federal standard, although there's still some gaps that uh, Chip will be talking about in a few minutes. I, I find this interesting from a, from a practical perspective because uh, often we have these areas, and this is one of them, where you uh, have changes in b patterns of behavior and the law really struggles to keep up with what's happening as far as the, the change in consumer demand and behavior is concerned. And we see this in particular in my market here in Seattle. Uh, one of uh, my uh, Bainbridge Island uh, cohabitants, uh, actually, somebody who lives in the same area I did um, on Bainbridge, Bill Marler, um, uh, has been a real strong advocate in uh, uh, representing injured uh, people in who had uh, had some foodborne pathogen or illness. Uh, Bill was actually just named one of the top 50 uh, names to know in the um, uh, in the food uh, industry. Uh, based on the lawsuits and the like that he's uh, filed uh, against uh, uh, packing companies and producers and the like. Uh, and uh, if uh, those are interested, they should visit his website at marlerclark.com. Uh, but what that means in Seattle is that we see a lot of activity and interest in the area of food safety, uh, generally speaking. Literally yesterday there was an E. coli outbreak here in uh, Seattle. So uh, in addition to, to GMO issues, we see a lot of kind of focus on food. Um, Chip, how have you seen this issue arise in your practice and the like? Right. Well, you, you know, going beyond, uh, you know, the food safety issues, uh, just in, in terms of uh, issues affecting people, uh, labeling in particular, that don't necessarily uh, physically hurt anyone, but has caused the uh, really an explosion in litigation and a, a cottage industry in lawsuits against the food industry. Uh, so you know, claims uh, that uh, products are labeled as natural when a chemical is, is used in uh, the processing of a minor ingredient or uh, that not all of the product is truly organic. Uh, the big fight that, that uh, you alluded to over uh, genetically engineered or, or GMO uh, uh, product. Uh, and this has caused uh, it's a political issue, as you alluded uh, to. Uh, Vermont had the law that was uh, scheduled to go into effect on July 1st. Maine had a similar law. Several other states uh, enacted legislation that uh, uh, would have required extensive labeling of products that uh, contain uh, genetically engineered ingredients. Uh, there are all kinds of new regulations coming out regarding uh, whether something can be labeled as healthy and under what circumstances. Uh, a rethinking of whether the term natural could be used at all in labeling. Uh, and the developments are coming fast and furious. I don't think there's a day that passes when a significant class action suit is, is not brought uh, somewhere in the country, and often many of them, uh, uh, you know, alleging all kinds of things, usually consumers who claim that if the label had been somewhat different, they wouldn't have purchased the product. Uh, so the damage is, is economic and, and not uh, not physical. So, uh, so, so it sounds like you're experiencing an increase in the client calls and questions uh, on this topic. Yeah, I mean it's it's really become huge. Uh, you know, food litigation has always existed, of course, but it was more of a backwater. But I think the the plaintiffs bar, and if there are any members of the plaintiffs bar on the on the, uh, the phone line, my apologies, but uh, you know they, they have seized upon this as an opportunity uh, to to go after the food industry 
uh, to seize on uh, consumers' uh, fears about what's in their food supply uh, and, and uh, you know, extract a premium in, in uh, settlement uh, since very few of these cases actually go the distance to trial. Fascinating. Why do you say very few go to trial? Well, th there are a couple of reasons. I mean, one, uh, to, to get there, uh, a plaintiff has to jump through a bunch of hoops. And second, just the cost and the expense and uh, the damage to uh, one's reputation in the market means that if it, if it looks like the case has legs at all, uh, a number of uh, food companies have taken the position that they would uh, resolve it early uh, rather than, than having their name in the paper forever and, and uh, spending a lot of money on uh, folks like uh, you and me. Got it. You know, um, we talked a little bit offline <clears throat> about the next uh, issue, which is what are the basic litigation risks? And one of the questions that I had asked was, uh, you know, what's the kind of life cycle of a typical claim and how quickly do claims resolve uh, and evolve? I, I, I wanted to kind of start by explaining the question and the basis for it. Okay. It, it's interesting to me to see kind of on the ground, I uh, work often in the front end of, of these types of issues. And what I find is that you have a couple of what I would call early warning signs that often are missed by the client um, because the people who receive those early warning signs aren't aware of the importance of what is happening. So for example, you have uh, a, you know, the uh, easy one is that an inquiry is made by a, uh, an agency, a state uh, attorney general or other uh, fair trade type uh, state agency, uh, asking for information about the um, product inputs and, and the like. And when that kind of inquiry happens, you know that it's likely that you've got a, a labeling or GMO type issue that is arising. The other area that I find that a lot of times clients miss are questions that are asked in to the customer service or the marketing department in kind of the lowest level. So by that I mean you get you start to get a, a, an increased frequency or pattern of inbound calls to customer service or inbound calls to the marketing department asking for information, uh, raising claims or concerns, or uh, you get a call from your customers. The, uh, so, so many of our kind of packing houses, for example, they sell to retailers. Uh, if there's an issue with the product, those retailers are typically the ones who are first uh, aware of it because they are the ones who get information uh, and requests from the attorneys general or the, uh, the FDA, the Centers for Disease Control. They'll get kind of questions about a customer. So, they, they get a, uh, one of their customers will call the retail, will uh, be sick or have an issue or have a question. Uh, they'll lodge that question in and, and it will go first to the retailer. And once the retailer sees three or four questions that all are arising out of the same producer, they'll contact their producer uh, and say, hey, FYI, this is kind of happening. And so you get a few days advance notice that there's an issue out there. And then the final way in the very earliest stages, is you start to, to uh, hear uh, in your industry that people are being asked certain questions. So uh, from your sub uh, supplier, for example, you might be getting questions uh, that are asked to them and then you hear you know, through the grapevine uh, that these kinds of questions are happening. So in the very earliest stages, uh, it is possible for uh, suppliers in particular to begin to understand that they have an issue uh, if they've um, drilled the importance of these things down into the lowest levels of contact points into the company so that those people can literally raise their hand and say, you know, hey, I'm noticing a change in frequency of the kind of calls I'm getting. So when is it that you first hear as a, as a litigation uh, expert about the, uh, this kind of a claim? Well, uh, I, I think you need to divide it into two types of claims. So, you know, one is uh, kind of the foodborne pathogen issue or, or somebody getting sick. And, and uh, there it, it, it typically happens upon an outbreak or there's a news report or, as you say, uh, there's an inquiry from 
uh, the state epidemiologist or, or what have you. Uh, and it's important to jump on those uh, immediately, of course. The, the focus here a little bit on labeling, it's, it's later. And so the part of the risk is you get blindsided a lot more. You think you're doing just fine, and then uh, all of a sudden you find out that a lawsuit's been uh, filed against you claiming that uh, you know, you're, you're being misleading in your label by calling something uh, natural or organic or uh, you know, they, they, you haven't uh, told the world that there might be some sugar in your fruit loops or, or what have you. Now, how do the plaintiffs find these, uh, the plaintiff's lawyers find their, their plaintiff? Uh, that's a great question, and, and plaintiffs' lawyers uh, are, are very creative about this. They have a number of ways, so, some of which has been helped by the Internet. So you mentioned Bill Marler's uh, blog or his website. Um, you know, again, it, it's, it's worth uh, looking at only because he'll throw out some topic, and, uh, again, his, his area of focus is more food safety than labeling, but the, the same is true. Throw something out. Uh, kind of makes an issue, uh, and then you know all kinds of people log in and say, "Gee, I had no idea this was going on." And then of course you, you get back to those folks and say, "Well, really, were you deceived? Were you, you know, this happened to you? How'd you like to be a lead plaintiff?" Uh, and since many of these products are widely consumed, it's uh, it's not terribly difficult for the plaintiffs bar to uh, uh, come up with a lead plaintiff and then uh, assert class claims. Are, are there any interest groups to try and uh, scour for potential plaintiffs? Uh, there are. Uh, you know, as I'm sure most people who are participating in this uh, webinar are very, uh, uh, know, uh, uh, the area of uh, food, food labeling, and, and uh, food safety uh, is, is one that has attracted widespread attention. So uh, you have everything from public interest uh, uh, groups, uh, uh, you know, uh, folks that, that, that believe that, that all food should be raised by Ned and Nell in a small one-acre plot, uh, and uh, uh, they're out there. Um, you know, and, and, and then uh, you've got the plaintiff's bar that sees this as a gold mine, and they're actively coming up with uh, kind of the topic of the day, and uh, through uh, either advertising or an online presence, uh, you know, searching for, for uh, plaintiffs all the time. Now, I, I was curious if there are uh, kind of hot spots in the country. You've mentioned Vermont and Maine. Uh, here in our region, Oregon has been very active in proposing uh, legislation of various types, California uh, as well. Right. So well, been... yeah, on the legislative front, uh, obviously, the uh, New England states uh, were uh, kind of leading the charge on GMO labeling. Uh, in terms of food litigation, uh, the three active states are California, California, and California. Um, you know, it's in part because of uh, the consumer protection laws in California, in part because it's a very large market, uh, and, and I don't, I'm being of course, a little facetious that these claims are being brought nationally, but um, uh, California is is kind of ground zero for a lot of food litigation. Um, you know, the, the courts are attractive to plaintiffs in large measure. Uh, the law is favorable uh, to uh, uh, plaintiffs in large measure. Uh, the California Supreme Court. Uh, in, in a case that uh, came out not long ago called Herb Time Farms, uh, issued an opinion making it clear that uh, uh, state law claims uh, over uh, uh, mislabeling, uh, whether something was uh, lab co correctly labeled as an organic product or not, were, was not preempted by federal law, which opens up a whole new avenue uh, for the plaintiff's bar. You know, I, I went back to the last slide because, of course, two of the cases that you identified there uh, were in California. So practical tip number one, apparently being avoid the state of California if you want to do business and stay risk-free. Uh, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, exactly. Somewhat large uh, uh, market. So, yeah, I've heard of it. Uh, and, and is the way uh, the litigation is handled any differently in different regions of the country? 
Well, uh, you know, I think the general procedures are more or less the same around the country. Uh, but as, as many of our, the participants in this webinar know, uh, in different parts of the country, uh, depending upon whether you're in a state court or uh, in a federal court, the laws do differ somewhat. There are some jurisdictions that are uh, more hostile to uh, these food claims um, and uh, others that are, are more generous. It's less procedural, I think, than it is uh, a matter of, of finding a jurisdiction where uh, the judiciary uh, and the, the legal environment is, is more ripe for making progress. Right. So I had some, some questions about the, the bullet points on the slide, uh, and actually starting with the last one, you say claims that make the head spin. I have to ask, what are the kinds of claims that would make my head spin? <laughs> well, some of these are, are well known and uh, some less, but uh, some of my favorites, uh, well, there, there was the claim against Trader Joe's for mislabeling soy milk because it didn't actually contain cow's milk. Uh, and uh, that, that met a, uh, a fairly quick end since uh, the judge in that case concluded that not too many consumers were likely to be deceived uh, that something called soy milk did not actually come from a cow. In fact, that might be exactly why the consumers were buying the soy milk. A um, uh, claim against uh, General Mills uh, uh, on a little more esoteric basis uh, for its product called Cheerios Protein. And under federal labeling laws, uh, you can't use in the name of your product uh, more than one ingredient unless you, you know, kind of label, give them all in, in, the, uh, in uh, a prominent space. And so the plaintiff said, well, uh, the name Cheerios Protein was mislabeling because although there was some more protein than regular Cheerios, there was also more sugar or whatever else. And again, the court actually said, well, Cheerios is not an ingredient, uh, so go away. Uh, and I think most people... About chips, it is in my household. Yeah, well, I, I didn't say it wasn't a, a key food group, but it's just not an ingredient. Um, and I love Cheerios, by the way. Uh, but uh, And then uh, I'm sure most of uh, our participants are familiar with the uh, lawsuits against Starbucks because uh, when you go visit the chain, uh, you'll notice up on the menu board, it, it says that, you know, the different sizes are, are so many grams. And uh, so somebody got creative and said, well, if I buy an iced beverage, it doesn't actually have that many grams of liquid in it because they put ice in it. Um, and there are a few of these cases around, although the, uh, a recent decision came down and the judge said, well, yeah, I don't think anyone's really likely to be deceived. I mean, if you order an iced beverage, you generally understand they're going to put ice in it. It comes in a clear cup, so you can see what's in it. And if you really want, you can just order it with no ice and solve your problem and get the full 32 ounces or whatever. Uh, but, but yeah, some of these things are really creative, and uh, you just think, wow. <laughs> you, uh, you just described a, a, a true trifecta of three cases where common sense prevailed. Yeah, um, fortunately. It doesn't always happen, but in those cases, yes. Now, um, if you could kind of describe briefly uh, the the other questions, you know, healthy or unhealthy, 100% gluten-free, organic, uh, why are these uh, litigation risks? All right. Well, the, they kind of describe the, the types of claims that are being brought out there. So uh, when I say healthy or unhealthy, one issue which we'll uh, talk about uh, a little bit later, which is actually uh, fairly good news, is uh, – when a product is labeled as healthy, um, you know, healthy to whom and under what circumstances. So there could be a lot of vitamins in it. There could be, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, important nutrients in the product. But if it's if it's got a ton of sugar in it, someone's going to challenge this and say, well, when you called it healthy, you didn't, you know, really. I, I bought it because I'm concerned about my family's health and didn't realize there was a lot of sugar in it. Um, vitamin water is an example uh, of this. Um, you know, the Coca-Cola company has this product. Uh, they, they term it vitamin water, and there are all these things where they said vitamins plus water equals, you know, relaxation and health. And, and somebody sued and, and said, well, yeah, but you've got 32 grams of sugar or something, or 35, I think it was, you know, which is just short of a can of Coke. 
you know, how are you describing this as healthy and implying that the only ingredients are a bunch of vitamins and, and water? Wonder why it tastes sweet. Um, and and uh, uh, you know, you also have to be careful what the ingredients are. So there's a case out there now in which somebody has sued uh, Post, which uh, manufactures shredded wheat, uh, which is a staple of our breakfast table. Uh, and they found traces of uh, glyphosate, which is uh, Roundup, uh, in the wheat. And so you didn't disclose that you know there were trace levels of chemical in this. Or in the case of uh, uh, palm beverages, all the pomegranate uh, products, the FTC uh, took those people uh, to court and uh, uh, kind of got a smackdown, saying, "Well, if you're going to uh, tell everybody that your products are healthy." You can't pick and choose uh, amongst the, the scientific uh, studies and only point out the ones that are in your favor. You have to give a more balanced view. So that there is a lot out there in terms of uh, what's, uh, what's healthy or unhealthy. And you, you use a terrifying acronym, the FTC. Uh, how, how are they involved? Yeah, and, and, and as probably everyone knows, that's the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and unlike the Food and Drug Administration or the Department of Agriculture, they are not specifically focused on food and agriculture, but uh, they are in charge of making sure that uh, advertising uh, is fair and, and not misleading. Uh, and so uh, here is a case in which it is not a plaintiff's attorney or a citizen plaintiff that's bringing a lawsuit, but the Federal Trade Commission taking a company to task uh, for misleading consumers in its advertising. So Ashley asked a question before the program that I thought was interesting and somewhat related to, to this um, slide, and that was, if you think that the uh, new labeling uh, standard requirements and, and the federal legislation will kind of spur additional GMO public awareness campaigns that, uh, you know, have a kind of GMOs are bad uh, uh, aspect to them, and, uh, and if so, uh, is that reinforced or uh, counteracted by the new legislation? Well, the, you know, the new legislation doesn't directly address that. What is probably more interesting is uh, the position of the Food and Drug Administration, which generally uh, uh, has uh, jurisdiction over food labeling. So it's, it's interesting that Congress, in passing the GMO bill, uh, gave the uh, assignment to come up with the actual regulations to the Department of Agriculture uh, rather than the Food and Drug Administration. But the Food and Drug Administration has made it very clear that based on the science that they don't view uh, genetically engineered uh, uh, foods as a whole to be any more or less safe than foods that do not have a genetically engineered component and therefore have uh, made it clear that, that any kind of uh, labeling that suggests that one is healthier or less healthy than the other uh, is, is not allowed. That you can, of course, say that you don't have any genetically modified ingredients, if that's true, uh, but, but you can't uh, tee off health claims. In the broader context, though, uh, you know, I think this is an ongoing area uh, that's kind of a conflux between the marketing side of things, the science, uh, and uh, people who do consumer research. Uh, as many of our, our participants know, and as you know, uh, many, many large uh, food producers, uh, notwithstanding the labeling legislation uh, and notwithstanding their uh, public view that, that there is no demonstrable harm to genetically engineered uh, products, nonetheless are uh, removing genetically engineered ingredients from their products or making sure that their suppliers uh, uh, provide them with non-GMO ingredients. And so this is a case, as you pointed out earlier, Mike, where consumer behavior is, is well out ahead of whatever happens on Capitol Hill. I, I know it's a shock that our uh, elected leaders may not be at the forefront of things, but uh, in this case, it's very true. Well, and as a, a, a partner in our Washington, D.C. office, you have a unique uh, perspective there. Uh, so now so my
Mike, before we jump off this slide, if I could make a couple other comments. Of course. Um, you know, I've, uh, the issue here with the 100% gluten-free and the organic and the natural, um, natural is a question that is, is uh, very confusing and it's interplay between organic and natural. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration uh, has elicited comments uh, from the public and received thousands of responses uh, as to whether it should uh, define the term uh, more carefully, how it would go about that, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, it will be interesting to see what actually comes of that, but, but there's a good chance, and this is just my guess, that the Food and Drug Administration may take the position that uh, using the term natural to describe a food uh, cannot be used anymore. I mean, they, they haven't gotten there yet. They haven't issued any regulations. They may say absolutely nothing. Uh, but because there's such confusion over does that mean organic, does that mean something other than organic, does that mean uh, GMO, there's going to be a, a, a lot more uh, said from the government on that, and it's worth keeping uh, a finger on that. Uh, the gluten-free comment has more to do with uh, making sure that you keep an eye on your supply chain. Uh, uh, again, getting back to Cheerios, uh, Cheerios uh, promotes itself as being gluten-free, and generally it is. One of their plants on the West Coast uh, had an interruption in supply because there was work being done on the rail line that fed the plant, so they had to uh, uh, truck in uh, their ingredients, the oats, I guess, uh, by truck, and there was some residue from whatever had been hauled in the truck previously uh, that was not gluten-free. And uh, General Mills promptly addressed this, uh, by offering full refunds to everyone who had purchased the product, which became uh, critical in a later court case in which uh, uh, the judge threw out the, the lawsuit saying everybody has been made whole, so why are you suing? Uh, but uh, it just points out that you also have to be very much on top of what's going into your product. You know, it's interesting because it also emphasizes what I described before. You had somebody who, you know, uh, tragically may have gotten sick, um, or uh, who had tested the product and found that there was gluten in it. And then they contact the person they bought it from and they, that person contacts uh, General Mills and uh, General Mills call, gets in touch with their supplier. And often, uh, you know, it's the supplier that, that really kind of caused the issue by, by putting it in the truck or having the truck not be adequately cleaned before it was used. Uh, but, but we don't use the name of the trucking company. We don't use the name of the uh, supplier, we, we use uh, the name of the defendant, which in this case was General Mills. So it, it, uh, it, it emphasizes the importance of, as you said, supply chain management and not only understanding the, the risks uh, and making sure that your suppliers are taking adequate steps, but also to, uh, you know, pr prepare yourself for the eventuality if you are the last in that uh, distribution chain that your brand may be the one really at risk rather than uh, the ingredient uh, brands and the like. Absolutely. So uh, I had asked you to, uh, is that it for this slide? Yep. Okay, terrific. So I had asked you to put in some, uh, some graphics and pictures and you ended up making me want to go on vacation. <laughs> well. So, so I love the picture, but what, is it, what does it uh, mean? Uh, well. This is being used as a metaphor, so I'm sorry this is not uh, the, next, the site of the next Dorsey and Whitney uh, retreat. Oh, uh, but, uh, you know, as you can see here, um, you know, the, the world is not flat. Uh, it's got a lot of twists and turns, and you can, uh, as you can see at the upper left, you can fall off the cliff if you're not careful. Uh, there have been a number of things that have really changed the landscape in, in food litigation. Uh, within the last couple of years, some of which we've already talked about. Uh, and, and so this is, uh, as we go into the next one, which will be of even more graphic interest, uh, this is more just a metaphor. So what has changed the landscape? Uh, well, these are three of the critical things that have uh, uh, changed it. I'm sure it's obvious to you, right, Mike? What, uh, of what course. Yeah. yeah, dinosaurs, hippies, and uh, drug products, it looks yeah. like. Well, close. So. Um, the first one in the upper left is a, a genetically modified organism. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. So I, part, I part of what it is, is, is technology. Um, technology is changing uh, uh, the way food is produced. Uh, it has tremendous benefits, but it also
scares people, uh, like uh, this guy. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, it's probably beyond the scope of this webinar to talk about uh, the, the fear factor that is attendant to food that is not naturally grown. And people point out that, you know, since uh, people start, first started uh, planting their crops in uh, Mesopotamia uh, thousands of years ago, uh, crops have been bred uh, either you know through uh, slicing the stalks on one another, or cross pollinating, or, or uh, what have you. Uh, broccoli, for example, was never a naturally occurring product. But people are really scared of what they term Franken foods, uh, and that fear is is driving legislation. It's driving uh, labeling, and I think that that's being reflected in, in the marketplace. Um, the second uh, change, which is not new in the last couple of years, has been going on for some time. Uh, these four people uh, are sitting there originating the organic and natural foods movement. Um, and uh, to, you know, it, this is a uh, historic photograph that you could treasure. Uh, but the, the interest in foods that are uh, natural, that are not highly processed, that uh, come from sources that do not use uh, chemicals. Uh, it's a little bit related to uh, the Godzilla-like creature in the upper left, but uh, it's a huge and growing segment of the market, as, as we all know. Uh, uh, but the claims uh, as to what is uh, natural, what is organic, uh, really confuse people. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting on this uh, picture. Uh, I grew up in Santa Cruz, California, and so I- These were your neighbors. They very much resonated with me. I may have even driven in that van. I think you uh, did. But but what's what's interesting to to me about it is that this does not look like a historic picture. This looks like something that might have been plucked out of you know American Eagle outfitters from today. Okay, and well you you busted me then. The, uh, yeah. But we, we get, I, I assure you that uh, we cleared the copyrights on this. There you go. Yeah. So the the last picture is a, a genetic testing kit. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can get these things at relatively low cost to uh, check out your uh, ancestry to see, uh, you know, uh, it's an updated uh, their, you know, pregnancy test and all the rest. But the reason that I use this is it is relatively inexpensive to find out the chem chemical composition of food. In, in the past, uh, one would need access uh, to a... Uh, a very sophisticated laboratory. It would be very expensive uh, to actually do an analysis to determine what's in food. That is no longer true. It's widely available to the public, and so it takes, uh, there's very little cost of entry for the plaintiff's bar uh, to run around and test food and find traces of this or that uh, and to file a lawsuit as a result of it. You know, I'm fascinated here, and I'm going to draw on the screen that you have changes in technology, both in the food, uh, uh, generally where you started, and the changes in testing technology that literally bring you full circle back to the terror associated with the change in technology. Right. Interesting. Yeah, te technology is, is driving a lot of this. It's, of course, driving fear in a lot of different sectors, but people think of food as you know, the most elemental part of living and have uh, uh, great fear over what changes are made, but also access to the techniques where uh, they don't have to rely on so-called experts to uh, uh, determine what's actually in the food they eat. They, they can believe they are one of the so-called experts, in fact. And often do. Now, how, how do these changes in the landscape affect the litigation potential? Well, uh, very simply because I know we want to get in and talk about the GMO law more particularly, but uh, you know, the plaintiffs know and their attorneys know that there is generally a general underlying fear uh, amongst the public uh, with regard to uh, changes that technology has wrought on the food supply. Uh, and any time that fear is an, is an element in the potential jury pool or uh, amongst elected representatives, uh, the, there is a high likelihood of an adverse result. Um, and, and so that, that is driving it. It's also driving consumer behavior, uh, uh, which explains uh, the robust growth in the organic and natural segments, 
but also provides an opportunity for people to say, well, it, you know, because you um, uh, treated your cocoa with uh, some kind of uh, alkaline product uh, uh, for your otherwise completely uh, organic product, uh, and you didn't disclose that you had, had uh, used a chemical in your process or that you used some kind of acid to preserve your fruit cup, uh, that you're misleading the public. And, uh, uh, you know, again, with technology and the Internet and everything, it's, it's easy for this stuff to circulate around and, and to, uh, to pluck topics out of the air, and, and it's relatively costless to bring a lawsuit. So as, as we leave this slide, uh, just one observation final. Uh, when I ask clients what do they love about working with their Dorsey team, uh, the response I get almost universally is that while we take the law and client service very seriously, we don't take ourselves too seriously. So I love these images and pictures and thanks. It was fun. All right. Uh, so, so we've got some changes in litigation risk uh, affected by the new legislation which we've been alluding to. and. Those who listened to the last program know a lot more about uh, as well. Um, and the first is the implications of it to the state efforts. And you've mentioned a, a three so far by my count, um, the first two uh, being uh, Maine and Vermont, uh, and then the last being California and possibly you know, holes uh, in the armor, as it were. Can you describe what preemption means and sure. the impact? Yeah, so preemption, uh, you know, it's kind of lawyer speak for saying that if there is a, a federal legislation in a given uh, area, uh, and if that federal legislation either specifically says, Congress specifically says, this is a federal issue, the states have to stay out of it, then the states cannot, uh, either through their courts or through their legislatures, uh, play in that sandbox and, and pass contrary legislation. Or if it's not expressed, uh, the courts look to see if a particular state claim um, uh, would run afoul of uh, what Congress was trying to do and really have control over the area. So there's, there's a lot of fights in, a, in these food cases that are brought under state law as to whether there's true preemption with uh, federal law, because many of the federal laws don't specifically say states you can't legislate here and your courts can't do anything. Many, it's a, it's a, a very complex, a federal regulatory scheme, and people are always trying to tuck in and say, yeah, but what we're doing is different, and so uh, the state law still applies. And so it so, sounds like that got strengthened in the area of uh, GMO recently, right? Exactly. So the federal GMO legislation specifically and explicitly said that the states cannot regulate uh, in the field of uh, uh, requiring labeling for uh, genetically uh, modified food products, and, and even went so far as to make clear that, that states couldn't do an end around by saying, okay, we're, we're going to require that only on restaurant menus or something. I mean, that Congress went far enough to say anywhere and everywhere, uh, you, you can't have a contrary state standard uh, that, that says uh, that there has to be a more robust uh, GMO labeling uh, uh, requirement. Now, you mentioned earlier that the statute delegated to the Department of Agriculture to uh, issue clarifying regulations, and obviously it's going to take a while for those to happen. Uh, while we're waiting for that, does the preemption still apply? Uh, absolutely. So, the, you know, the, state, any, the Vermont law, which was passed and was set to go into effect uh, upon the passage of the federal legislation, uh, immediately rendered the Vermont uh, law void. So the good news is that uh, industry does not have to run around and worry about 30, 40 different states all coming up with different uh, uh, standards and labeling regimes, which would of course be chaos. You, you'd have to, uh, you know, have a different label on the cans that went to shelves in Vermont than you did in Iowa, different from Kentucky, uh, which was one of the big concerns. So that's off the books, but, but what is going to be in its place uh, Congress gave considerable guidance and direction, but the exact regulations, uh, uh, the, the USDA has uh, just under two years to get those written. So obviously the concept of, of truth and labeling is much broader than just GMO. How does this new statute affect that in, from a litigation perspective in particular? Uh, well, from a couple of things. Number one, and you'll see this in the second bullet, 
Um, you know, there, there has been litigation in which, uh, well, Chipotle is the target of litigation on a number of fronts, but in, in this case that I'm about to describe, uh, you know, Chipotle got out and they have this big expensive advertising campaign that says we've gone away from GMO ingredients and all this stuff. Uh, and then some enterprising plaintiff's lawyer figured out that that may be true with regard to their plant-based material, but uh, was not necessarily true with regard to the meat that they were serving. Uh, you know, so then the question is, well, if, if you have a regular, uh, you know, heifer or steer or something out there, but it's eating food that might have come from uh, genetically uh, modified corn, uh, does that mean that the uh, beef is genetically modified? And the law very specifically says, uh, you know, no way that, that uh, you know, animal protein is not going to be deemed genetically engineered because of the feedstock. Uh, the, the law also tries to make it easier on industry rather than slapping a big uh, label on the packaging that says uh, some of these ingredients may have been produced through genetic engineering or through modern scientific techniques or what have you. The idea is that there can be, uh, that, that industry will have the option of either using that in text or uh, having a QR code or some kind of symbol or a link that consumers can follow up on. Um, you know, the consumer advocacy organizations are against this because they think it's a dodge and people are actually, while they're in the supermarket, are not going to follow through on a link to find out what's in the, the can. But it, it, it seems to me that that does give you the option if you realize that there's a labeling issue to fix it in one place and have it almost kind of automatically apply uh, to any product that's still in the distribution chain, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, the, the benefit of this, uh, that, that you can actually be more robust uh, in your description because you could say these are the 12 ingredients in our product. These, the following ingredients are not genetically modified. Uh, you know, this ingredient may have been, and you can provide uh, complete information uh, uh, through that. And as you pointed out, as, as more information uh, 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 arises or uh, as the supply chain changes, uh, you can make uh, uh, changes to your, your customer disclosure. Uh, I, I should point out that although um, the uh, Ag Department has not yet issued its final regulations, it is moving on this and, in fact, has already issued uh, guidance um, in, the, in the area of meats and poultry and egg products. Uh, formally or, or formerly, um, there couldn't be any kind of what's called um, uh, negative claims. That is, uh, USDA wouldn't allow anybody selling meat or egg or poultry products to say these are non-GMO. Uh, in light of the federal legislation, uh, they are now allowing those negative claims. So uh, some of these issues we've kind of already talked about, but could you address the gene editing and CRISPR and explain what that means? Sure. So, uh, and, and with the caveat that I'm not a, a scientific expert, but uh, CRISPR is an acronym for kind of the latest version of uh, genetic modification in which uh, specific uh, elements of a genetic sequence can be uh, removed or added. Uh, so unlike uh, traditional uh, gene technology, uh, this is in which chemicals are used and, and you know, you, to move things around, this is very precise. Uh, and um, is, is kind of the new frontier for uh, both human health and in curing diseases, but also uh, in uh, uh, changing crops. So, for example, a, a, um, I think it was a, a mushroom that was recently approved that used CRISPR technology uh, to make sure that uh, the mushroom would, would not turn brown. It would keep its white uh, appearance. Um, and uh, that is done through CRISPR technology. The way the GMO law is written, it defines, uh, you know, genetically, um, uh, you know, genetic engineering in a, in a limited way and does not apply by its terms to CRISPR technology. So, of course, that's going to be the whole next thousand yards, as my grandmother used to say. Uh, 
you know, we've got this whole new regulatory scheme and it, it doesn't even keep up with the latest technology and using this new technology is completely outside uh, the federal law. So I'm thinking then from a litigation perspective, it means that uh, you need to have some collaboration here between your research and development, your quality assurance, and your marketing team. And that keeping you know documents and records of what you're doing is going to be important. Is that a fair assessment? Absolutely fair. So recognizing we've got only a couple minutes uh, left and, and that I wanted to make sure we hit the trinity of caramel, almond, and sea salt, uh, w w other than its incredibly tasty uh, flavor, uh, what does the, the Kind Nut and Spices program give us? All right. Well, uh, apart from it being nearly the noon hour out here on the East Coast, uh, th this is emblematic of some of the developments in the, the uh, food litigation world that are actually, and, and regulatory world that are actually positive. Uh, I, I have kind up here, although it, it didn't particularly apply to the caramel almond and sea salt variety. Uh, the uh, Food and Drug Administration issued a warning letter to the maker of kind saying, uh, you have the word healthy uh, in your, uh, you know, on your products and in your advertising, and under our regulations, it can't be healthy. And the reason for that is under the 20 year old uh, FDA regulations, um, you know, if you had more than three grams of total fat or one gram of saturated fat per serving, you couldn't claim that something was healthy. Uh, Kind fought back and they, they filed a citizen's petition to have that reversed and said, you know, this science is old. Uh, you know, it presumes that, that all fat is bad and interestingly, for those who uh, uh, saw the article in the New York Times yesterday, uh, which referred to a recent article in JAMA Internal Medicine, uh, it, it now appears that the sugar industry uh, for several decades was uh, you know, funding uh, studies that would, would impugn fat uh, to kind of clear sugar in connection with, with heart disease. I hope we don't have too many uh, sugar producers on the line who are offended by that, but that was the report. And Kind said, well, if you do that, you can't call salmon healthy, you can't call avocados healthy, you can't have nuts, and their products have nuts in them, which, which kick up the amount of fat. Uh, the FDA relented uh, and said, okay, what we're, we'll allow you to do is healthy as kind of a corporate philosophy uh, rather than a health claim to get around it, but more importantly said, we're going to revisit all of our existing regulations concerning what's healthy or not. So that's something uh, to be aware of. Two other developments in our limited time that it's uh, uh, important to talk about. Number one, as I mentioned earlier, there have been some recent cases that have said if you make your customers whole, uh, it, it moots or, or eliminates the uh, possibility of a lawsuit afterwards. So if you sell a product uh, and the consumers say, uh, you know, wait a minute, there, there's something wrong with it, or you, you uh, have a non-GMO ingredient, if you uh, get right out in front of it and say, we'll, we'll buy the product back or reimburse your expense, you could probably uh, avoid a lawsuit. And a number of cases from around the country have also said, if you can't prove that uh, you really have a, a, a loss uh, going forward, we're not gonna give you standing to bring a suit. In other words, you, you bought the, the product today believing that you know, there was no sugar in your vitamin water, you, you can't, you know, now that you know that, you can't claim that you're going to be harmed on your next purchase. So, you know, get out of court. Uh, so, so in, in conclusion, just recognizing the time here, yeah. can you, what are the top five things that people could take away today and, and implement to protect their company? Sure. Number one, know what's in your products. That means looking through your supply chain, uh, constantly doing testing and make sure that you're being accurate about what you represent there. Number two, uh, be straightforward in your labeling. You know, the, the FDA has recently come out and said you can't call sugar evaporated cane juice. Uh, you know, don't come up with the, the silly uh, uh, acronyms or the buzzwords. Say what's in your product. Uh, three, get involved in the regulatory process. Uh, you know, the Department of Agriculture is going to issue sometime its proposed regulations on the GMO labeling. There will be a comment period. Uh, people who are interested in this issue need to stay abreast of this and comment and let the uh, Ag Department know what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Fourth, and you talked about this earlier, uh, Mike, uh, 
you know, if there are customer issues, get on tap of those early. Uh, if it's worthwhile, rebate the purchase price, make your customers happy, uh, it, it'll pay dividends in litigation. And finally, don't, get, uh, don't let your advertising get ahead of the product. Uh, make sure the science is good in your claims. Uh, make sure that you're not saying something about your uh, product that you can't back up. And in order to kind of stay abreast of things, uh, can you tell people a little bit about Liability Desk? Sure. Uh, this is a site. It's at liabilitydesk.com. Uh, it is a free site. Uh, Dorsey, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, provides uh, uh, much of the content to this site. Uh, this is a, what we do here is, is every day pretty much or every other day uh, provide new content that, is, that describes uh, developments um, in, in food and nutrition, in medical devices, in technology, in, in other areas. Uh, developments regulatory and cases that are worth noting, uh, and it also includes uh, a video series uh, uh, on an educational note. Uh, it's free uh, to sign up, uh, and you can get weekly updates of the top stories of the week. Uh, part of our way of keeping our clients and, and friends uh, up to date on developments in the law. Awesome. So, of course, uh, we provide those updates in person as well. Uh, our contact information uh, is here on the slide. If folks have questions on this or other topics in litigation or in the food, agribusiness, or cooperatives area, uh, we encourage you to give your friendly Dorsey lawyers a call. Two of us are up on the screen here. Uh, the participants will be getting a um, link after the program from Ashley Hubble who manages our continuing education credit. And uh, in order to get CLE credit, you'll, you'll need to respond to that link. The, um, uh, you uh, also will be getting a survey, and we really encourage people to give us feedback on the format of the program, on the topics that we've covered, and also on other topics that you would recommend. So with that, uh, Chip, thank you so much for this great program and great information. And thank, thank you, Mike. To, thanks to all the participants for joining us.